Welcome back to Intro to World Music, Music 239. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at the video from Bali. And if you did, you noticed the, um, the, the slab player, the metal slab player, using his thumb to mute some of the uh, notes after he had played them so that they would not be ringing through and conflicting with the next notes that he was going to play. It's a very complicated style and a very specific, precise uh, technique of playing this. Also, uh, you saw toward the end the drummer, uh, who is essentially the conductor of the ensemble. Uh, it is he who is responsible for changing tempos and for changing to different sections of the piece. So, hope you enjoyed getting to see that video. Now, as we finish our section on Indonesia, uh, it's important to realize that what we've looked at so far is all traditional music, but there is a great deal of popular music being made in Indonesia, and your text has three examples that I would like to show you. Three different ensembles that created popular music. Uh, uh, the first of these is a track called uh, Begadong Tu, which is the in the Dongdut style by Roma Irama. Okay, and uh, he's essentially a pop musician who decided that he needed to bring in more Indonesian elements into his pop music. So as you listen to his music, see if you can identify which elements of these are Indonesian and which of them are from the West. So, what elements of these are Asian and Indonesian? Oh, okay, kind of stopping and then and going. Well, that, that's an interesting one that I hadn't thought of. Uh, maybe similar to the Balinese uh, Kabyar style. That's interesting, yes. It's a little bit of the oscillation thing with the voice that we heard in the. Ooh, right, right. His, his voice has quite a bit of ornamentation and oscillation that's going on in it that we've heard in other Asian cultures. Certainly, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the language is Indonesian here, um, but also if you listen to what the synthesizers are playing, that little melody, there is quite a bit of detuning that's gone on in there to perhaps uh, uh, sort of emulate the sound of Slaindro or Pelog just a little bit uh, in terms of what the synthesizer is doing. So there is a, a bit of cross-cultural uh, fertilization going on here, and your textbook has the translation of the text which is also, I think, very uh, influenced by this culture. What good is Saturday night for those who are not well-to-do, want to go to a party but have no money, wind up squatting by the side of the road? Stay up, let's stay up. Stay up and sing even though we don't have money, we can still have fun. So there is a, a cultural reference here to some of the poverty as I mentioned before, there are people that are fabulously wealthy, and then there are some people who are amazingly poor. Uh, and so this uh, cultural uh, combination of these two forces uh, leads to a lot of unrest and songs like this one that help to do it. As your text points out, several of his songs were banned by the government because they tended to create unrest and uh, civil unrest, and so we see a, a sort of a, 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 a governmental control of music coming in here where the musicians who write in this style have to be very careful what they say and how they write it so that they don't get censored or in some cases put in jail for writing sensitive lyrics. The second example that you have is, uh, is actually a jazz fusion group called uh, Krakatoa. 
What is Krakatoa? Yes. It's a volcano in Indonesia. Yeah, it's a volcano. Yeah, yeah, and it, uh, there was a huge explosion back in the, uh, uh, the back in the 19th century that uh, wiped out, yeah, wiped out a large uh, portion of the uh, population and uh, created a big tsunami. I mean, it was a, a big deal, the explosion of Krakatoa. So this band has named themselves after that volcano. And what they do, they've had a lot of influences with jazz artists such as Chick Corea. Uh, their goal was to really integrate jazz music with the Indonesian uh, influence and sound. And so they actually use some gamelan instruments in their piece, which you will hear in here. You'll hear some of the slab instruments. You'll also hear a rabab fiddle playing at one point. Uh, bringing that into the jazz fusion concept is uh, their goal, and they've done a very nice job here. Um, they also play with a fretless bass, their bass player, so that he can play in slandro and pelog instead of playing in Western tunings and match up with what the gamelan instruments are doing. So they're really attempting to create a true fusion of these two cultures in this piece called uh, shuffle and dong, shuffle and ding. Where does that name come from? Do you read about that in your text? A shuffle is basically a, a type of, of music. It comes from blues. Uh, and uh, a, a gospel blues shuffle is a particular rhythmic style. Uh, the dong comes from one of the instruments, the, the gendong, and the ding comes from a gonding, which you all know by now is the name of an actual composition for gamelan, a ginding. So uh, it's, it, the name of the piece itself is a fusion of East and West. Here's a bit of that composition. <laughs> It sounds as if Chick Corea went to Bali and on vacation and came back with a set of slab instruments and uh, put into his latest composition, because there is a real Chick Corea kind of influence there, and yet the uh, uh, Indonesian uh, influence is unmistakable in a, in a piece like that. The last piece that you have on this uh, CD in this unit is not quite so Indonesian influenced. In fact, most of it is strictly Western alternative rock. Um, but the lyrics that you find in your text uh, for this tune, which is called Distorsi, which means distortion, um, are very much influenced by the culture and by the politics of the area. And he had to be careful about how he wrote it so that he didn't get thrown into jail because he's basically complaining about the government. Uh, but uh, the, the, this was a very big hit in 1978 uh, by Dani Ahmad Manaf. Um, they always want to combat poverty, but there's always someone who drains off the money, the people's money. There are show-offs who open their mouths in protest but it's a shame their mouths always smell of alcohol. The youth are drunk, the elders corrupt. Great is this country, great is this country. They always want to strengthen justice, but there is still the residue of the law of the jungle. Uh, so it goes on to talk about uh, the uh, perception of the people in terms of how the government is really doing at combating poverty. Listen to a bit of this piece 
as you listen to it, uh, it really doesn't sound like anything that couldn't be uh, an American alternative pop kind of sound. <laughs> Really, in this case, the only thing that is truly from the Indonesian culture are the lyrics and the meaning behind the lyrics. Everything else is pretty much Western in this case. So you have three interesting examples of pop there that uh, are written in an Indonesian style and influenced in one way or another. So let's review a little bit about this unit on Indonesia. Uh, the terms to know, the, first of all, what is a gamelan? The tuning and the scales, the slandro and the pelog, the gunding, what is a gunding? A composition for gamelan, right the loud and the soft playing styles, and, and what, uh, what would a loud and soft playing styles be used for? Soft would be used for shadow puppet, right? And loud is used for Ceremony, like ceremonies like weddings or things like that. Uh, and in some cases, uh, uh, it's played for parties where they're not expected to sit and listen to the music. In fact, that's the norm. Uh, there's one composition that talked about where uh, they would not stop playing until everyone had left. Okay, so it was designed to accompany people actually leaving the room. Uh, and so that's, uh, that, that's one of those interesting things. It reminded me a little bit of uh, the um, story of uh, Joseph Haydn's Farewell Symphony. Does anybody know that story? Joseph Haydn was the, uh, you know the, the Farewell Symphony story? Right. right, the orchestra leaves one by one during the last movement until there's only one violin player at the very end that finishes the piece. And why was this piece written? Uh, didn't it symbolize to uh, the Esterhazy? Yeah, right. right. That they needed a break. Exactly. From, uh, exactly, they needed a break. The, the, um, Haydn was uh, hired by the court of Prince Esterhazy to write music for their parties every, uh, every day, basically, or every week they would have a party. And um, they were supposed to have gone on vacation, and the prince scheduled another party instead. And so uh, Haydn wrote this farewell symphony to give his employer the message that they were supposed to be on break. Uh, and so he got the message, and they all got to go on vacation after that. As far as I know, nobody got fired. But the, uh, the interesting cultural comparison of essentially having people leave one by one is here with the Gamelan Orchestra where they won't stop playing until the whole audience has left. That's one of those interesting cultural concepts that I like to draw comparisons between. On the differences between Bali and Java, uh, what, do you, um, what do you remember about that? Yes. Um, in Java, the music is a little more stiff and rigid. Okay. The rhythm, well, Bali, it's very fast and soft. And okay. So in Java, the music is more stiff and rigid. In other words, it stays at the same consistent dynamic level and the same consistent tempo throughout. Whereas in Bali, they tend to have more frequent changes of both dynamic and also tempo. What else? What does Bali have that Java does not have? Oh, that's in, that's in Sumatra. That's, the bamboo's not in, in Bali. The beating, the beating effect, yes. The beating effect is in Bali, but not in Java. 
And also, <laughs> there's that term for the very fast playing style. Kabir. Yeah, Kabir. Uh, that fast playing style of Bali. So make sure you know those differences. And then, of course, the beating effect you, you, we just mentioned, but it's good to have an idea of how the beating effect is created. Bali tends to go from extremes, like very loud to very soft, very quickly, whereas Java tends to maintain the same loud or soft level all the way through. Good question. Good question. Any other questions on this, on this unit? Okay, the, um, the next assignment is another thinking assignment, okay? Another thinking assignment. And what I'd like is another essay in which you get out your undergraduate catalog, but what you'll find are the goals of general education. Why are we doing this? And what I'm asking you to do is to relate things you have learned in this class to those goals. So take those five points, and what, what I'd like you to do in this is actually just list one, two, three, four, five for each of these goals. And, and, and more than just a, a list, one through five, I'd like you to write a short paragraph about each one in terms of the aspect of this course that you have found fulfills that goal. Okay? So that's the, that's the next essay. Are there questions about that? Yes? Is that online? Uh, this, this is online. Yeah. Oh, 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 the catalog. Yeah, you can find uh, the undergraduate catalog online if you go to uh, academics on the university's website. Navigate through till you find it. Yeah, you can, should be able to cut and paste that if you need to. Um, okay. Let me finish up this unit um, on Indonesia by saying that uh, this is the last aspect of Asia that we will study during this course. And we've studied several Asian cultures here, and when I first talked about it, I mentioned that it was an East meets West kind of thing, and we talked about some of the differences between the East and the West. And some of the, we've seen some of the cross-cultural influences on, on one or the other, East influencing West, West influencing East. One more of those that I'd like to point out to sort of tie up this particular unit uh, and our study of Asia in general is the process of minimalism, so-called minimalism, which began in about the 1980s or so, although I think the roots of it come a little sooner than that. And uh, some of the composers who are most famous for that, uh, writing Western art music, are Steve Reich, Terry Riley, and Philip Glass, probably Glass being the most famous of the three, to, certainly to non-musicians. Um, what these composers did was to go to the East and study Eastern music, and then bring it back to the West and reshape Western art music in the image of the things that they had learned in the East. And that's just a gross generalization. It's actually a misnomer to call it minimalism because the composers who write in this style actually refer to it more as process music, where the music is undergoing a process of change little by little over time. Let me give you a couple of graphic examples. Um, Steve Reich has a piece called Pendulum Music in which four microphones are hung in front of individual loudspeakers attached to the microphone so that when you hang a microphone in front of a speaker, what happens? Feedback. You get feedback. And so he deliberately produces feedback, and then he, ha he suspends each of the four microphones from the ceiling and swings them back and forth in front of the speakers so that when it comes in front of the speakers, you get the feedback howl, and then when it comes 
up on the top of the pendulum, you don't hear it at all, and you get these interesting kinds of effects because you have four of them going on. And the piece lasts as long as it takes for the pendulums to stop. That's usually about 15 minutes, it turns out. Okay. So you listen to 15 minutes of feedback uh, loops in, in sort of interesting combinations, and that's the piece. Okay. Another example of a piece is taking a very simple five-finger pattern on the piano and having two players play this pattern over and over and over again. And then slowly, one of them slows down and goes out of phase with the other one. And then slows down enough that it goes in phase, but the notes don't line up with each other anymore. And then the second player slowly starts to speed up again, goes out of phase, and eventually comes back in total phase with the first player, and the piece ends. This takes 25 minutes to do. Okay, so you're listening to that same pattern for 25 minutes. It's called Piano Phase by, uh, by Steve Reich. Yes, the first one was called Pendulum Music. Okay, I got to hear both of these perform live on the same concert one time, and that was the whole concert. Yes? Universal Pain, is that, do you consider that music? Universal Pain? What is that? Do you consider that music? Universal, uh, oh, these two pieces? Uh, yes, humanly organized sound. Yeah, I think it's music. Right, right. But I, I went to a concert of the Philip Glass Ensemble in about 1982, and um, and it, it's 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 very repetitive music. It takes a long time for it to happen because it's a process that's taking place over a long period of time. The music is changing very very slowly over that period. And I went to a concert of the Philip Glass Ensemble, uh, after which the Dean of Fine Arts at the university where I was attending, who also attended that concert, was quoted in the student newspaper the next day as saying he imagined this would be the music that would be left after a total nuclear holocaust. Uh, that was his opinion. He, he wasn't too fond of it. It's East meets West. It's taking the whole concept of the fact that the Eastern listener doesn't mind sitting and listening to music for all night. The, the, the Indian uh, concerts that we heard about would go on all night. The Sara Saruha piece on your CD lasts 23 minutes, right? How many of you listened to the whole thing? Uh, only a fraction, right? Some of you did, but, but, but not all of you took the time to listen to that whole thing, right? Because you're working on a different time span. The, uh, the Shadow Puppet Theater goes on how long? Eight hours. Eight hours. So the Eastern frame of mind is dealing with time in a different way than the West is, as I've been saying all along. Now, uh, in, the, uh, in the early 80s and late 70s, Philip Glass was approached by some filmmakers to assist with soundtracks of, of films. And one of the most famous of these is called Koyanis Katsi. Okay, Koyanis Katsi is a Hopi Indian word meaning life out of balance. Anybody seen that film before? You have. Yeah, there's there's three. It's actually a trilogy, isn't it? Yeah. Is there? Yeah. Okay, so, so there's a MySpace group, and it's sort of a cult following of, uh, of these films. Uh, if you get a chance to check them out and would like to watch them sometime, uh, you, you, you may have to buy them nowadays. I'm not sure they check them out at the video store anymore. But Koyanis Katsi uh, is a film in, entitled Life Out of Balance. It's wall-to-wall -wall music and video images. There is no dialogue. Okay. Uh, and life out of balance means basically that life on this planet is uh, what the humans are doing is out of balance with what nature has actually intended. So the first part of the film, you see some very serene shots of deserts and oceans and natural kinds of phenomenon. And then slowly you start to see human influence creeping in. And 
toward the end of the film, you start to see how humans and society have mechanized themselves to a large extent. So hopefully you got the chance to view the segment of the film entitled Koyanis Katsi uh, and the particular segment called The Grid in which we see uh, a great deal of process music taking place and the idea of the mechanization of society. Uh, a lot of interesting shots in there, particularly the segue between the, uh, the hot dogs coming down the conveyor belt and the humans going up the escalator that uh, is, a, is a direct contrast. And then um, also the way that the mechanization of the line workers happens in time to the music. All that music, by the way, played by the Philip Glass Ensemble was played uh, live with, a, with acoustic and synthesized instruments and uh, none of it was sequenced by computers and so it's, it's really fascinating when you listen to how it was created. Uh, yet another example of human mechanization, I suppose, that the movie is trying to get across. So we finish this unit on Asia in this course uh, by looking at East meeting West and making social commentary about the mechanization of society in Koyanis Katsi. Although it is not strictly part of the Indonesian culture that we are studying, the music of Australia is very close regionally to the music of Bali and uh, Java, and so uh, I could not resist showing you some footage uh, of a student that learned how to play the didgeridoo. Uh, Braden Elliott was a student here at Missouri State and actually took Music 239 and as his final project he learned to play the didgeridoo uh, and uh, it was such a fine presentation that I uh, wanted to include it in this course. Please welcome and enjoy the work of Braden Elliott. Um, I'm going to talk about the didgeridoo today. Uh, for your benefit I'm going to try to make it a little bit educational and a little bit entertaining. Uh, let's start with the history of the instrument. The didgeridoo is the traditional rhythm instrument of the Aboriginal Australian culture, I guess. Um, along with the bull roarer and clap sticks or the boomerang hitting against anything, that's really the only primitive music that uh, we've really found in Aboriginal Australian culture. The didgeridoo is typically made from a branch of a tree hollowed out by termites. It's usually a eucalyptus tree. Sometimes you make them out of bamboo, which grows rather hollow naturally. Uh, a didgeridoo maker will usually cut off the branch wherever it flares at the end of the tree. This is not a traditional didgeridoo, by the way. So it'll flare a little bit at the end. It usually has a couple curves in it to give it back pressure, and then round off the edges and put some beeswax on it so that you can make it the proper size, shape, and general comfort level of opening. It's played much like a low brass instrument. You can play a tuba just like a didgeridoo. It just has a little bit more in the metallic tone because it's a more uniform inside and a much sturdier uniform metallic material that the entire instrument is made out of. One common misconception about the didgeridoo is that it's just a drone meditative instrument. Uh, the way it was developed and the way it was cultivated in the Australian practice is a very rhythm oriented, a very lively instrument and I'd like to try to imitate that later today. I'm going to show you both styles. Culturally, the didgeridoo is significant because now, in today's world, 21st century, we think of the didgeridoo as a cultural symbol of Australia, especially after the Sydney Olympic Games. But if you've ever seen the movie Rabbit Proof Fence or really looked into Aboriginal culture, uh, you probably have found in your research, just like I did, that the Aborigines were suppressed nearly to the point of extinction for hundreds of years. Um, their culture grew and flourished and set itself up for thousands of years on Australia, but then Western colonists, especially from the British Empire, uh, sailed in one day and said that we're technologically superior and we're taking over, therefore the Aborigines uh, might as well be extincted or extinguished because they're inferior to us and we have every right to this land so we're just going to get rid of them. They would fence off Aboriginal areas, they would steal Aboriginal children to put them in indoctrination schools. Um, that's really what the movie Rabbit Proof Fence is all about. So it was only in the past couple decades, like maybe the 60s or 70s, that ethnomusicologists discovered the didgeridoo which was still uh, played as a traditional instrument, especially in Arnhem Land, which was 
uh, north, uh, yes, north central Australia, and that's where the Aboriginal culture had managed to hang on for the hundreds of years that they were being repressed. Um, so ethnomusicologists brought the didgeridoo out of Australia. It was accepted as a world kind of instrument now. You can find it at pretty much any tribal hippie gathering. Uh, a bunch of people playing in New Age meditative styles saying the didgeridoo is an aid for medication it, or meditation. It calms the body. It levels you out. It almost puts you in a trance state. But that's almost um, kind of a bastardization of the instrument itself. Uh, it, it's the same instrument, technically. It's a tube that you blow on one end, and some people have learned to circular breathe with it. But it really doesn't open up any of the potential of the instrument that the Aborigines developed with it. Um, I'm going to do a couple little brief, I guess, clips of some techniques that they would use. First of all, there's the basic drone. Um, next there's um, your vocal cords used in conjunction with the basic drone so that you can create a harmonic or a dissonant interval at the same time playing through the one instrument. sound effects like the kookaburra. the didgeridoo is actually uh, Yerdaki is one aboriginal name. It wasn't called the didgeridoo until ethnomusicologists discovered it because the word didgeridoo was the sound most commonly made whenever didgeridoo players got into their groove. Finally, I'm going to give you kind of a, a contrast of styles first, and you'll be able to tell the two sections apart. First, I'm going to play a really slow, droning, meditative, new age style piece, or just session. And then I'm going to play a faster, more up-tempo, uh, traditional, aboriginal style. And in the middle, I'm going to set the tempo up with uh, the spoomerang here which was traditionally used by the Aborigines, much like a clap stick. You would have a stick in each hand, but this time the didgeridoo player would hit the didgeridoo, set the tempo, and then the group would go off that. Sometimes they'd play for hours without stopping. Now that we've basically covered 
uh, the playing of the didgeridoo, you probably noticed that I really wasn't taking noticeable breaths as much, especially on the drone part. You probably saw me breathing in while the sound kept going. It's a technique called circular breathing. Uh, contemporary uses, you might uh, remember that Kenny G could hold a note for something like four or five minutes. It, it's one use of that technique. I don't know if it's the best necessary use of circular breathing. But I want everybody to try a little exercise. First of all, fill your cheeks with air. And then what you're going to do is push out with your cheeks through your mouth. And at the same time, you're going to breathe in through your nose into your lungs. You're going to, you won't think about this consciously, but your epiglottis is going to separate your esophagus and your trachea so that um, the air that's going in through your nose has a straight path down the bronchi into your lungs. And the air that's in your mouth, whenever you compress your cheeks, won't push back down into your lungs because it's not connected to your lungs anymore. Uh, you could probably ask a, a medical person for a little bit better explanation of that. But the one simple move looks like this. And so in practice, the use of circular breathing is to refill your lungs without interrupting the airflow out of your mouth. So if you're playing a wind instrument, you can continue to blow that stream of air out your mouth. And then the tricky part for me is reintroducing the air that you have in your lungs next after that. So the continuous circular breathing would look like this. And uh, I hope that this has been educational and enlightening and inspiring and that maybe we've spawned a didgeridoo or didgeridoo debt.